So, yeah, just look at this for a while. Interesting that they say it, uh, they're calculated in real time, the same rates at which you do it, which is kind of interesting. That the calculations and rendering are so fast. I guess that's great. Models aren't much use if it takes uh, two years to run to get your answer, and the answer is what happens in 10 minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is just following on from what we talked about last time. Uh, so, uh, so we'll talk a little bit today about kind of what your majors will morph into, I think. I mean, there's a reason you take these introductory courses in thermo and in fluids, because they're kind of fundamental. Uh, they're probably the first classes in your uh, career that kind of lead into your, your majors. And um, so petroleum engineers look at uh, modeling uh, flow in uh, porous reservoirs, uh, environmental systems Engineers recover contaminants from aquifers. Um, geothermal engineers, we have a geothermal engineering course for energy engineers, which is exactly the same problem as petroleum engineering. And uh, one of the examples we looked at last time was decommissioning of a mine and the, the flow around that. Um, you know, one of the big industrial problems around here, uh, Greymont, which is a limestone mine in Pleasant Gap, is they basically spend all their money pumping water out of their open pit mine and sending it to the fish hatchery. And so that's a, a groundwater flow problem. And so uh, we'll look at two things today. Uh, we'll look at kind of porous media flows, uh, which are not these. And we'll look at um, open channel flows, which are these, right? So if you have something flowing in the air or squirting out of a hose, that's uh, an open channel flow. And it's dealt with in a different way. But these are just uh, using are two concepts, uh, conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Uh, they're defining little uh, boxes. I guess I don't certainly defining little boxes, which are these control volumes that fluid goes into or out of. And solving a set of equations, maybe for each box you have uh, three, four equations. Three velocities, x, y, and z and one pressure, fluid pressure. And so if you have three, four equations for each box and you have 10,000 boxes, then you have 40,000 equations to solve. And so it becomes pretty uh, computationally intensive. And then on top of this, I guess, if you have things falling off a lighthouse like that, then I guess you have rendering to do as well. And so uh, they're very complicated, complex models that are used. And so we'll look at kind of try and simplify that uh, and break it down to really what its essence is in, in, and kind of introduce it. So you'll see it first here to perhaps maybe understand how it goes together and you'll see it multiple times in the, the courses uh, as you uh, continue in your majors. And I guess mining engineers look at trying to get air to people so they don't asphyxiate in underground mines. So open channel flows within pipes which is uh, the tunnels, adits and openings, is the other useful thing that uh, is important for them. So that's kind of where we're, we're going today. So, so that's the eye candy to, to get us started. Um, and the other point that we made was that the other forms of flows are related to this. We talked about it last time. Uh, this is... Yeah, I think later on it showed a section. Yeah, so this is the idea. So here, you know, this, this mesh that the water was going around the lighthouse was, or flowing down the hill, was kind of an um, adaptive mesh. It moved and it conformed with the fluid that was confined in it, so you had to add blocks to it as the, the level rose. Typically for porous media flows, you know, this is a hillside. I suppose this is probably a tailings dam that has tailings uh, from the removed minerals, which are then ground down, processed to get the ore out of them, and then the, the rejected minerals are just placed behind an impoundment dam and left to uh, get the water, let the water settle out of them. So this was uh, maybe on the first time we met, we looked at this Lardello uh, tailings dam in Brazil, this uh, red earth dam that collapsed that killed a couple of hundred people uh, in Brazil a couple of years ago. Uh, and there have been other ones, maybe not so devastating in terms of uh, lives lost. 
But this is a big industrial problem, uh, the stability of these things which impound basically a slurry of tailings. Tailings are just very high content, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent water and some soil, the, the, the remains that come out of the processing plant, and they're impounded behind a dam which itself is made of the same drained tailings. And if you have a small earthquake or a big earthquake or if for some reason uh, you don't design it quite right, you lose the dam and this whole thing moves. But that's a different problem for the one we're talking about here. Here we're talking about what is the flow of water within the aquifers and within the dam uh, within a geometry that really doesn't change. That's the set geometry of the hillside and what are the flows within it. So we'll talk about two things. We said porous media flows, which is what this is. And we'll talk about then about open channel flows, which is a much more challenging problem uh, and is a bit different, but it's useful for us to be able to talk about each of them. So that's kind of our plan for today. So uh, let me get going. We're recording. I guess we don't need any more than this. Um, so if we do that, uh, I'm not sure. So these are the things that we'll deal with today. I guess I can open this get my favorite color for a change. And so um, we didn't quite get here, but you know, uh, so the first thing is porous media flows. I guess it's singular. And so that's the, this, the last thing we looked at in terms of the, the mine closure. And so what's usually done there is that we can get away with using our uh, conservation, well, it's written there, I don't need to put it. This is conservation of mass. We know this equation, right? We've had a summation on this, and we've had uh, these terms here. If we look at the case where the volume isn't changing, let's get rid of that, and we can do that. And if we look at the case where we have a little differential cube. I guess it needs to be differential in size. So this is x, and this is z, and this is vx, and this is vx plus change in velocity in the x direction. And if we multiply this by 1, Uh, and then if we look at this, this would be distance in the x direction. This would be height in the z direction. And it would be a, another, if we look at this as a perspective figure, this would be dy. I guess it would be a cube rather than a, um, a square. Then we can write this portion of the sum of mass flow rates are going to be equal to what? The density times the area, which is d z d y, and multiplied by the velocity in. It's in, so it's negative, plus the velocity out, and plus dvx dx dx and that term is going to be equal to density what do we lose? we lose the fact that this cancels with this and we're left with dz dy uh, dx times rate of change of velocity in the x direction with x. And so that's the, the sum of mass flow rates in the system. And of course, if we looked at solving it in each of the other directions, where this would be, um, can't draw it, this, this would be velocity in the z direction plus rate of change of velocity in the z-direction dz 
easily, just the same. We'd end up with terms that are change in velocity in the y direction with y and change in velocity in the z direction with z. And so that is exactly this expression here, right? This is the volume. I should draw these as squiggly bracketed things. So this is density, volume, and this. So that's where that equation comes from. And so the conservation of mass equation we can write in differential form uh, if you want to solve differential equations. And we know that this uh, right-hand side is the velocity times the rate of change of density. And so we could write this, um, sorry, volume times d rho dt. If we multiply by pressure, this is pressure over pressure. And uh, we can write this as equal to rho volume. And I'm just going to write the one term, dvx dx. And so um, what can we do here? Well, I want to take out these. So this is the basic equation that we'll use. I'm going to join these two so they're together. And so we'll have a volume times change in pressure with time. This is the ringed term here. I'll go back to some other. So change in density with pressure is equal to density volume dvx. I split to a, diff a partial differential. It doesn't really matter. There's no meaning in that. And I guess what I could do is choose even another color. And I could divide both sides by rho v. And rho v. And see what terms we get rid of. So we get rid of this term. I'll just write it out. So we'll get d vx dx should be a minus here I guess right because it's uh, adding them together right We're just adding these two terms together so this should be a minus and what are we left with we're left with the change in pressure with time and we're left with we have lost this and we have 1 over rho D rho dp. And so this term we saw on the first, second day of class, 1.2. This is equal to uh, modulus um, which is equal to a change in density with a pressure. So actually it's equal to 1 over, one over modulus, right? which is equal to, I don't know why this is responding so badly today, it's got a lag to it, which is compressibility. This is compressibility of a fluid. So this is saying that the, if you want to write it out, mass in minus mass out, mass rate in, I guess, dot mass dot mass out, is equal to accumulation. So if we write that out, this is the compressibility, this is the change in pressure with time. It doesn't matter that you understand these things now, but you'll see them many times in your future. Is equal to change in velocity in the x direction with x. And so then what we take is typically done is that if you look at Darcy's law, which we talked about last time, Darcy's law is just a, an, obs, an empirically defined law that says that if you look at the change in pressure along a core sample, you can write the velocity of flow. The velocity is equal to 
um, minus permeability over viscosity, change in pressure with location. So this pressure gradient, this is obviously dp dx. You can run a test that does this. Apply an upstream pressure and measure how much flow comes out into your bucket on the downstream side. Right? This goes into a bucket. Uh, if you measure the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate that comes out from this area, you have this value. You can apply a pressure. You know how long your sample is. You know that the viscosity of water that's flowing in it is 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, of that order anyway. And so the only unknown you have is permeability. So K is permeability. Um, it's in units of Darcy's, or in terms of SI units, length squared. And so the utility of that is that we want to be able to put this equation into here. And so if we do that, we end up with something that looks like this, which you will see. There's a negative here. There's a negative here merely because of the fact that this is the positive x direction. This is a positive gradient, but the flow is in the negative direction. So that's what this term here means. And so this is k over mu d2p dx squared. And so it's taking this velocity, which is this velocity, it's defined it in terms of a pressure gradient, and that pressure gradient means that this equation is written only in terms of a single variable, and that is that that's the pressure. So now, if you write this single equation for every single little cube you have in your, your mesh, then you can, if you have a thousand cubes, then you solve for a thousand equations. And you solve for this by discretizing it. So that's basically what, what's done. So that is useful uh, for what we'll deal with. So this is the typical equation for petroleum engineering uh, or for geothermal engineering when you work in terms of permeabilities. and compressibilities. So this would, in a shale gas reservoir, this would be the compressibility of the gas, um, which is quite compressible. And in kind of groundwater hydrology, the equation is typically dealt with slightly differently. And the observation is that um, pressure head, so we know from Bernoulli that the components of the Bernoulli um, energy grade line are V squared over 2G. So typically in, in all flows, subsurface flows, these terms are very small, essentially zero, and the only terms that are left are fluid pressures and elevation. And so this is often grouped together in what's referred to as the hydraulic head. Hydraulic, bad, bad writing, hydraulic head. And so if this is pressure is substituted into this for hydraulic head, I'll just quote the result, is that you end up with an equation that looks like this in terms of the, the corollary, if you like, of the equation above it. And in this particular case, this, this is referred to, oh, wrong one. Press, pressing the wrong button. This is the, referred to as the hydraulic conductivity. And in terms of the, um, the units we've talked about, permeability and viscosity are related to this term by hydraulic conductivity divided by the density of water times gravity. So these are related. So the units, I won't do it here, but the units of this are the same as velocity, meters per second. The units of this are 
um, meters squared, just different ways of looking at the equation. And so I, I mentioned this equation here because we'll use it to solve a very simple problem in a second using what we'll call as um, flow nets, uh, which is actually very, very straightforward uh, when you think about it. But um, these are the two expressions that you'll end up using in, in your careers as you go through. You'll see these things many, many, many times. And so really what it's doing is it's allowing you to solve problems that look specifically like this where you can um, divide your mesh into uh, volume elements. They don't necessarily have to be e equal uh, sized, x, y, and z, dx, dy, and dz. They can be elongate, but you allow water flowing into one side, water flowing out of the other side, water flowing into the top and out of the bottom, and also if it's in 3D, there's flow into the page. And so um, you, you just uh, solve the se sequence of equations. So I don't, don't know how many boxes are in that particular example, but there are a lot, right? So you don't end up with the number of equations equal to the number of blocks. So what we can also do with this is we can change it, and we can look at only steady behavior. So if there's no change in head with time, then we're just left with this equation being equal to zero. Uh, and so if we want to solve steady problems, uh, then the expression that we use is merely this right it doesn't matter if it's got something be before it it can just we can forget that uh, or actually in two dimensions it would be in x and z it, it would be this expression and also that the velocity in the x direction is equal to hydraulic conductivity times dh dx. So this is uh, Darcy's law, but written not in terms of pressures, as it is here, but written in terms of hydraulic heads just a bit, bit easier. And you'll, you'll see the reason for us doing that um, otherwise. So this is a velocity. This is in, uh, well, you can tell me. This is a head, so length. Length is equal to a velocity. So the units of velocity and hydraulic conductivity have to be the same. So hydraulic conductivity has to be in meters per second. And we've already said that. And so, uh, without going into the math, because we don't need to, there's a whole idea of this of stream functions, and we can play around with that. The punchline is that if we can draw a flow net, a net that has the streamlines that we've talked about in Bernoulli, and that has uh, perpendicular lines to that, which are called equipotentials, because they have the same equal potential, equal head along those lines, then that actually satisfies this uh, second order partial differential equation. That, that's the, the punchline, I suppose. And so if, uh, as we did when we looked at, um, say, open channel flows, we can look at, say, a streamline and a streamline on top of it and a streamline on top of that. We're just imagining these. And if we can, perpendicular to that, I know this is an open flow, not a porous media flow. If we can define lines that are perpendicular to those, then from what I just said about uh, this net immediately satisfying that par uh, partial differential equation, then we can, if we can draw a flow net that has the requirements that these lines are perpendicular to each other, and that the lengths of the boxes that we have are equi equiaxed, then we can actually quite simply calculate the flow rates in our system. That's all it is. And so you see a little narrative here um, coming, coming down to this. So this is the idea that if you had the dam, actually it fits in nicely, I guess, with the picture we just looked at. A dam that has some 
boundary conditions of a streamline at the top, which is the groundwater table surface. It has a stream tube, which is isolated by the next flow line down. And that this net actually satisfies our desired requirements of these kind of largely being both perpendicular to each other and also the length of these. These are squares, rough squares, kind of curved squares. So this is the idea. And so perhaps it's easier just to go back to here. So if we talk about flow nets. And if we talk about a, say, a, a flow tube. So I'm just drawing a flow net, a very simple flow net that happens to satisfy those requirements that we talked about. And so if I talk about a flow velocity in, if I talk about a magnitude, some kind of datum, and this is a magnitude Z1, and C2. And on top of that, I put something which is P1 over gamma and P2 over gamma. Then I didn't draw that very, I guess I can draw it above it, right? Then this is dx, and this is dh, because together this is equal to h1, and together this is equal to h2. And that this direction here is just x, hence this. Then I guess we could write that, um, and if I take one of these out, and I draw it as this. Where this is, say, DL, and this is DW, or just W, I guess, or not just W. Then I can write that the velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity times change in head with length. I could multiply that by area on each side, where that area is just going to be this cross-sectional area here, right? Probably getting more complicated than I want. So this then is W, I guess, times 1 into the page. And this is also W times 1 into the page. Together, this is a volumetric flow rate Q, right? That's coming out of here. So we can think that Q is equal to the velocity times the area. This is just meters cubed per second versus meters per second and meters squared. Um, and so this would be that volumetric flow rate is equal to the width of the channel. Um, multiplied by a hydraulic conductivity times dh. dh is going to be h1 divided by what I'll call the number of drops. nd equals number of drops. So this would be zero drops, one, two, three, four. So just counting down from upstream. And then we have this term here. dx is just going to be dl. Right? This term here is just this. And so we can rewrite that as the width of the flow channel divided by dl, uh, multiplied by hydraulic conductivity times um, uh, 
So I didn't need to. So let me get rid of this. I'm just going to put in H2, right? It's going to be uh, H1 minus H2. I'm just going to replace this. this. This has to be H1 minus H2. The difference between upstream and downstream, I still don't get that. And all, all you need to know is the punchline to this. So this is H1 minus H2, which works out to be very simple, and divided by number of drops. Because we've said that this flow net, if we have it, these lengths and widths are the same because it's a square, then this goes to be 1. And the punchline is that the flow in one stream tube is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the, the change in head across the system, delta H, divided by the number of drops. So this is for one stream tube. If we have multiple stream tubes, as we do here, right? We have one stream tube, two stream tubes, three stream tubes, four stream tubes. Then the whole flow rate coming out of here is just going to be the sum of those. And so the total flow rate out of here is just going to be the product. So the Q total is equal to QS times uh, number of stream tubes. Uh, this is going to be QS, and this is the punchline. The total flow rate is going to be hydraulic conductivity, the drop of head across the system, the number of stream tubes divided by the number of drops. That's it. So that's the deal. And so it makes it very easy uh, to be able to calculate flow rate through a system. So you typically know what this is. You can define this from your geometry. You can measure this from your flow net, and you immediately have the, the flow rate through the system. So just to illustrate that, for this particular geometry, this is the, the math that goes into it. So the idea would be that you'd have a system that you would see that looks like this. Um, there would be a downstream water level, the downstream toe of the dam, um, everywhere within this, right, on this surface, this amount here would be equal to, if you looked at the pressure at this particular place, this would be P9 over unit weight. So this would be, uh, the pressure at this point would just be equal to the, the height, the depth of this, and this would be Z9. And so this pressure would just be equal to this depth of water. If you went down to this position here, then the pressure at that point would be equal to this, and the remainder of it would be made up by the elevation. So the point is that all the way along this boundary, the head is equal to the magnitude of this height, this height H9. That's all it is. Likewise, all the way along this boundary, as you go down here, it's a swimming pool that we're looking at, right? So at the free surface, the pressure is zero. As you go down in the swimming pool, the pressure builds according to the, uh, the depth you find yourself at. And so at here, the pressure would be zero and the elevation would be H0. Z0 would be the elevation. And as you go down to any point, this pressure here would be larger. It would be this height of water above you, and the elevation would be equal to this amount here. So the point is that defining the behavior in terms of heads defines that all the way along this boundary, the head is uniform. All the way along this boundary, the head is uniform. And then that is joined by uh, a network that defines the, uh, the water table another flow line that's next to it. And so, so long as you can uh, draw, draw this flow net so that it intersects, um, I guess I should do a, a big one here, if it intersects a boundary which is a constant head boundary, which is H0 on this boundary, 
a constant head boundary which is H9 on this boundary and that therefore you can draw in a series of other equipotentials so this is um, so there's nine drops right one two three four five six seven eight nine so this is eight ninths of the drop seven ninths of the drop six five four three two one zero ninths of the drop and so from this if you're going to calculate the flow rate Q is equal to the hydraulic conductivity, which we need to know, the number of flow lines divided by the number of drops times delta H. And so for this particular example, whatever this is, one meter a second, the number of flow lines, one, two, three, not flow lines, flow tubes, I guess, four. The number of drops, which is going from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, multiplied by H zero minus H nine, and H zero minus H nine are just these lengths. So, in other words, the difference between them, delta H here, which we have, is just equal to. This, this length, this is delta H. That, that's all. So it's actually a very simple, simple way of doing it. So very, very simple, but very powerful. And so it all comes from the fact that um, if we go back to here, all we've ever used is the idea that we used conservation of mass, which is kind of interesting because we're solving a problem that has frictional losses in it. Darcy's law speaks about frictional losses. So we're only using a conservation of mass equation. We're kind of fudging in the influence of the head losses in Bernoulli. So remember that in Bernoulli, we have pressure over unit weight plus elevation plus V squared over 2G plus pump heads is equal to upstream pressure plus head losses. So that's our, our basic equation. So what have we done? Well, we've said that the velocities are so small, we don't care what those are. We'll throw those terms away. And so a big groundwater flow rate might be a meter a day. So a day is 10 to the 5 seconds, so it's um, 10 to the minus uh, 5 meters per second, so it's tiny. The heads that we had in this, you know, might be 10 meters. So this is an, a trivial number compared to those. We group these two terms together, and we call it head, as we define down here. We don't have a pump within our system, so this is zero. And so what we do is we account for the fact that the head losses in the system are illustrated to us by the fact that we have to apply an upstream pressure, and that pressure downstream has diminished even though it might go in at a pressure, come out at atmospheric, and it might be horizontal, this is actually a loss in the system. So the loss in the system is given by Darcy's law. And so using only conservation of mass, not momentum, and using an expression that accounts for the head loss in the system, which is Darcy's law, we come up with a partial differential equation which we're able to solve, and it just turns out that one way to solve it would be by drawing these, these, uh, these flow nets. And so it's very powerful because if you can draw by eye a flow net that satisfies the boundary conditions in terms of heads, upstream and downstream, this would be upstream, this would be downstream, and you can join those up with some streamlines and equipotentials that are just merely satisfying the requirement that they're right angles to each other and that they're roughly the same width as they are length, then you have a solution to that. So it's a pretty, pretty powerful thing. So anyway, you can look at that. So that's the kind of e easier part of, well, it's one part of this. So the other thing that we talked about, which also is, can be important in what we're dealing with, 
is how we get these simulations. And so this is obviously a different kind of behavior. And obviously this flow isn't occurring within a porous media where we have the drag due to Darcy's law. This is just like me throwing out a, a beaker of water into the audience at you. And so clearly we can't use the concept of Darcy's law to do that. And so it gets a bit more complex. But if we look in kind of broad view about it, it's really not that um, terrible, maybe. And so what we have to do is we have to then go back and we have to use not only conservation of mass, which we've added Darcy's law to represent the head losses, but we have to use conservation of mass and the conservation of momentum equations that we've talked about, and include the effect of viscosity, which is the reason that we talked about conservation of energy this week, which is kind of like conservation of momentum, but has this frictional loss in it. And so without going through the excruciating details of what's going on, is we can take a, a conservation volume for our conservation of momentum equation. We can look at the stresses that are applied on that volume, the pressures that are applied upstream and downstream, and the velocities of fluid going in and out, and do conservation of momentum on it. And if we did that, then we'd expect to end up with some equations that look have the components that represent the Bernoulli terms. So you know the Bernoulli terms are these. Let me write this. This would be the right-hand side. You know that this behavior is symptomatic of F equals MA. So this is due to the fluid accelerating from place to place. This is the pressure that the fluid has. This is the potential energy that it has being high or low. And this is the frictional losses that are lost as a function. So this is due to, it's not viscosity, but it's due to shear Newton's second law. This is due to viscosity. And so if we apply conservation of momentum to something, we would end up with terms that look like this. And so we can do that complicated thing for this control volume. We have to do it in the x, y, and z directions. And so we'd expect to get conservation of momentum in each of the x, y, and z directions. So three equations. And so those three equations look like this. And they look like a term which includes mass times acceleration, density times velocity over time. So this is, in this particular derivation, the velocity in the x direction is u, the velocity in the y direction is v, and in the z direction is w, just by, this comes straight out of the textbook. That's not important. This represents the elevation term, and this represents the pressures, p over gamma doesn't particularly matter. So these are these terms that exist here. And they go into these three equations. Uh, if we throw in uh, Newton's law for viscosity, which looks a bit different, looks like this. It relates a stress in the system to a viscosity and a velocity. So certainly you can recognize this term, right? We wrote it before as tau is equal to mu dv it would be du dx in this term. It doesn't matter. And we end up with a, an even more complicated system, which again is a bit like our Bernoulli expressions. So the Bernoulli expressions here are that this term on the left-hand side is equal to mass times acceleration. So everything to the right of that has to be the force part. And as part of this force part, we have a component that is equal to the pressure head, a component that's equal to the elevation head, and a component that is equal, equivalent to, I guess we've called it HL, right? 
So if you think of this term, this is v squared over 2g. That's all. So you end up with a very complicated Bernoulli equation written in the x direction. You could think of it as a tube in the x direction where you're looking at v squared over 2g written in terms of differentials, the pressure, the elevation, and the head loss in the system. And we can solve that for uh, expression. And so it gets kind of complicated. Uh, but we can, for very simple geometries, we can perhaps try and solve this. And I'm not sure whether it's useful to do this, other than to say that we can, we, if we want to solve this system, we have to solve in x, y, and z directions. So we have three equations, as you see there, numbers 1, 2, and 3. If you look at the variables in these equations, we have velocities, we have things we know, densities, and viscosities and gravity we know as variables but the dependent variables are velocity in the x direction velocity in the y direction and velocity in the z direction so three variables and we also have fluid pressure so we have four variables velocities in all three directions and a pressure at a point and since we only have three equations, we need another equation to solve it. And so just as in the case of Bernoulli, if we had more velocities to solve for, then we, we, if we had two velocities that were in the unknown and related to each other, we could write rho a1 v1 equals rho a2 v2. And so in the same way that if we had a stream tube that had flow within that tube, that had velocities downstream and upstream. We could close the Bernoulli equation with this. Then we can do that exactly. And the equation that we close it with is the one that is at the top. I'm not going to go back there. Is the one that we started off with today, which is just going to be density times dvx dx plus dVy dy. This is the very first thing we defined this morning. Update canvas announcements. Okay, I'll be sure and do that. But when I get back to the office, maybe. And so the, the idea is that this equation has to equal zero. And so this is the, the fourth equation that closes. Velocities in x, y, and z, and a pressure. So to solve for those four variables, you need four equations. And you solve them at every single point in your mesh somehow, and we won't talk about that. The other thing we can do is we can attempt to take these equations and solve them for very simple geometries. We're kind of running short of time, so I'm not going to uh, blow your minds up by going through what we need to do. But we could write these equations for a very simple geometry. And one very simple geometry would be for taking two parallel plates to represent, say, flow in a duct in an air conditioning system. And we could force fluid to flow between them and try and solve for that. We've already said before that when we talked about Bernoulli, we had these alpha terms on the velocity squared term. So when we're solving for the energy equation, we said that this term is always equal to 1 uh, under our usual assumption. And our usual assumption is that the velocity profile across uh, a boundary in a, in a pipe is always uniform. This is our assumption, and if that's the case, then this goes to be equal to 1. But the reality is that's not the case. This is the case if the viscosity is equal to 0. And if viscosity is equal to 0, then it's not stuck to the boundary of this duct. But the, if the velocity is not equal to 0, then we know that one of the boundary conditions has to be that the velocities where it contacts a, a surface holds it there at zero velocity. And that between that, it would vary between them. So I guess if we looked at a uniform velocity, it would look like the red line. The average would be the same as this average if you integrated it. But if it's a viscous fluid, then the velocity in the middle will be large. The velocity of the edges will be small. The area under the blue curve versus the red curve should be the same if the volumetric flow rates are the same. But we'd like to know exactly what this expression is 
uh, for flow in a duct. So we could solve this equation by just using these uh, four equations, throwing away all the terms that we don't need. So for instance, if we look at this, if you imagine a particle of fluid going down this duct, you'd think it would just translate with the other materials. So there is no velocity in the z direction. There is no velocity into the page in the y direction. But there will be a velocity in the the x direction. So immediately we can put the velocities in v and w are zero. And then if we look at the continuity equation, if uh, these velocities are zero, then we have an expression for this. And, and I don't want to get into that. But basically, we can take the equations that we have here, we can throw away all the terms we don't want, and I suppose the punchline is that we can get an expression that gives us a volumetric flow rate, and the volumetric flow rate through that duct is equal to tw the aperture of the duct. So this is the height of the duct, 2b to be or not to be, right? To be. Around the middle point. And it's proportional to this cubed. It's proportional to the pressure gradient along the duct. And it's divided through by 12 times the viscosity. That's it. So, so the point is that if you can write those differential equations, you can solve them for simple geometries like this to get a very simple expression that defines what the flow rate is in a duct if you now have viscosity acting and the profile of the velocity across the duct will um, vary with uh, x. I don't know if I have that equation on there. Um, yeah, the velocity across the duct varies with this expression, doesn't matter. It will look like this, it's a parabola in reality and it allows us to get an average flow rate along the duct. We could take a similar approach and look at the same behavior in a pipe. Anchor the flow at zero velocities at the edge. It'll have a maximum flow velocity in the middle. And we can come up with a volumetric flow rate within the pipe. This is our uppercase Q. And also how the velocity varies across the pipe, which is equal to zero at the boundaries and maximum in the middle. If the radius uh, is equal to zero, then the velocity, uh, no, that's the average velocity. So this is the average velocity. So this is the actual velocity here. It's equal, if r is equal to zero in the middle, then this is equal to one times the maximum value. So this is u max here. If r is equal to the radius, uppercase r, then this divided by this is one, and it's independent of where you are on this, then this is equal to zero, and then it, it mimics this behavior here. So the point is that using these equations, we can either get very simple expressions for some very simple geometries, and this would be useful if we're looking at flow within pipes, and the other one would be useful if we're looking at flow in ducts. And if we keep all four, the full set of equations, uh, then what we can end up doing is we can end up solving in a numerical model, a complicated numerical model, we can end up solving more complicated geometries that are open channel form. So the point is that uh, we can use what we've done so far. So week six, seven, and eight, finishing today, have been um, conservation of mass, momentum, then energy. Conservation of mass allows us to be able to solve for the porous media flow equations, so that long as we have something to account for the the head loss in the system, we call that Darcy's law. If we want to solve for open flows, such as these where it flows into an open medium or an open duct within a, a, a pipe, then what we need to do is we take our conservation of momentum equations and conservation of mass together. Uh, we include viscosity in the conservation momentum equation and that gives us our conservation of energy equation, which was kind of weak theme of week eight that we talked about today, this ending today. And we end up with three momentum equations and one conservation of mass equations. At each point, we can imagine that we have three velocities, x, y, and z, vx, vy, and vz, and we have a pressure. 
And so if we solve each of those equations at every single point within our mesh, the mesh being given by this kind of uh, background uh, gray area here, which is growing adaptively, and we solve those uh, many equations, then we can come up with kind of cool numerical results. And then I guess these numerical results in this particular case have some kind of rendering thrown over the top of them to be able to represent really quite a, a realistic view of what's going on and perhaps even more realistic here. So that's it. So, that's, that's it. so this is kind of the, the, on, uh, the entree to your, uh, your majors in some respects. All of your majors will deal with either porous media flows or open, channel, open flows in some way. And this is kind of where our simple ways of looking at mass conservation and Bernoulli with head losses translates into those equations that you'll use further in your future. We won't use them anymore in this class, really. That's it. So, um, well, welcome. Join me again. Of course, you don't have much option on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'll be online on Canvas. I was surprised that not many people joined on Canvas. All we have going on Canvas is that we have an, an open chat. So if you want to ask questions, you can do that and see the answers. And you can see the answers of anyone else who asks a question as well. So do that if you wish. Same protocol as before. One click only. Again, this time it's, it's much uh, better. I know people were using it to try and figure out what the answers were. I think that's not a good use. It's not very kind to you to do that in some respects. Because I think people panic if they don't get all the right answers. And of course, it's. And so it'll open at 7.55, close at 8.31. Same deal as before. Um, as I say, scores go up as we go through this. So take heart from that. Um, they are more formulaic. You know what the questions are, and you have um, the materials to look at. So look at those. Look at old exams. Look at the review materials. You can probably second guess, guess what questions are from previous exams. They, there are only so many. I'm not smart enough to think of completely brand new questions each time. Um, and so they, they start repeating themselves, kind of, but, but not exactly. So that's it. Any questions before I get going? Okay. So, all right. So, see you virtually on uh, Monday. I'm not coming in here. We just because no one, no one. It's much easier to do it where you are in your home. But the classroom obviously will be open if you need to come here. But I just won't be here. I'll be online, as you can. All right. Happy hunting next week. <laughs> <laughs>